Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to Facebook Live, YouTube Live, all the lives that exist out there in the world these days with everybody sitting in their work pajamas or their night pajamas, wherever you are. I am Steve Rosenberg. I am the host today of our show, and I am an investor, author, entrepreneur, business person, and I am the vice president of investor education for Mind Property Management. And today is going to be a great show. I'm so excited to meet this guy. I actually did not want to talk to him until we actually met just a couple seconds ago, introduced to us by several people, mutual friends. Uh, basically, they said, you got to have this guy on, especially with everything that is going on in society right now, in real estate, in the environment, in the culture. Um, and, and Jay is an expert at this. So if you are in those doldrums right now that you don't know what you're doing, where you're going and what your life is going to look like post the new norm, which I hate that term, by the way, but that's the term everyone uses. Uh, you're going to learn a lot from Jay and I am as well, because I really want to understand kind of the human psyche of what gets people down, especially when we're involved in real estate and we're trying to learn new things because this is the time that gets very scary. I always say the great thing about real estate is there's no rules. You can do whatever you want and there is no one to tell you you're not. The bad thing about real estate is there's no rules and you can do whatever you want. So if you're watching us, um, give us a thumbs up. Tell us where you're watching from. Jay is kind of doing a whole kind of digestion of who watches these shows, where they're calling from, and he wants to kind of understand more about this. Uh, let me just say, though, that before we kind of dig in with Jay, you know, this kind of stuff, you know, is very important. It's not just buying, flipping, wholesaling a rental property. To me, what we're doing here, especially with Bigger Pockets, which is what I love about Bigger Pockets, is they give us a platform to basically grow and educate each other. And, and I think that's great because there's not many places that do this really for free. I mean, I, I donate my time to Bigger Pockets to everybody watching because I think it's important that we need to all realize that four walls and a roof is not going to make us successful and money is not going to make us happy, right? There, there's a much bigger picture when you start creating wealth and when you start understanding what you're doing and why you're doing it, there is a much bigger purpose because Money will come and go, but who you are as a result of making that money and, and the lives that you change, I think is really, really the key here. And I wanted to have Jay, uh, I, I had several people that knew him, that, that he came from, from Bradley to Christine Beckwith to, to other people that said, you got to have Jay on. Jay's the guy, Zach Connolly, which I know Jay, you know. Um, I, I just, I, and I thought, man, this would be a great guy for bigger pockets because Again, it's not four walls and a roof. It's who you have to become to make that four walls and a roof successful because we all know very, very wealthy people that are miserable inside and they're basically poor inside and vice versa. And I, and I think it's what we kind of tell ourselves on a daily basis and what we bring to the table every morning that we wake up. And, and Jay is going to talk about that. So this is all about engagement. Um, Jay has been, you know, nice enough to donate his time to Bigger Pockets. So, if you have questions, please make sure you put comments in there, and we will talk about this. Um, but Jay is is essentially. I, I'm going to kind of do a quick intro, but Jay is an expert on culture, and and I cannot explain how vital culture is. And if anyone that has ever owned a business or been in a relationship that has had a bad, toxic culture, relationship, partnership, that is so toxic and that can ruin the best things. I, I call it the Guns N' Roses effect where Guns N' Roses was killing it. Maybe I'm dating myself. I don't know. But, you know, they were, they were just killing it in the world and they broke up. So they didn't break up because of money. They broke up because the culture got so toxic in the group that that is why they did that. And if you don't think that that cannot happen to you, in this business and what is going on today with this COVID-19 and the new norm and all these new fancy words, you're, you're kidding yourself. And, and it will take you, and flying, we say it takes you to the crash site quicker. 
that's exactly what it'll do if you ignore it or you choose not to pay attention to it. So uh, again, please leave your comments and, and we will um, we will try to address them as much as we can. I see we already have a ton of people logging on. Uh, Eric, by the way, the plane in the background is a 787. That's uh, the plane that I fly. So it's a actually it's a model. I'm sure you figured that one out, but it is a model 787 that you can get made. Um, so Jay, thank you so much for coming on the show. I hope I did you at least a little bit of justice of, of talking about who you are and what you do. Uh, thanks for coming on, man. I, I really appreciate it. Tell everybody who you are, what you do, kind of what your superpower is and all that kind of stuff, man. Yeah. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, beyond what you would say to me, you've demonstrated your care and your trust and honor of me just by inviting me on. Appreciate it. What Appreciate we think it. and what we say doesn't reveal what we believe as much as what we do. Okay. What we think and what we say doesn't really reveal what we, who we are. It's what we do. So uh, thank you for the you know, label as the expert. Uh, however, to, 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 to articulate it, I've, I've created two theories that work in juxtaposition. The culture puzzle, which takes story, language, symbolism, mediums, and the visionary, which ties into the liar lid journey. These two theories, the liar lid journey and the culture puzzle. Think of like a circle. In the middle of the circle is the honest liar, the visionary. And then above is the story and below it's the mediums and then language and symbolism. And I work behind the scenes with organizations one-on-one -on -one with the founder or active leader, you know, e.g. CEO, to help them clarify what these stories, language, symbolism, and so on needs to be to attract the people that would most likely fit into the organization, help the individuals within the organization become more educated within their competencies in relation to whatever the educate or the, the system does, the company does, and potentially let go of the people that don't fit in the organization while working one-on-one -on -one behind the scenes with the owner of the organization. How I deliver this theory is not by going into an organization and talking at the company and teaching the employees how to think and act. It's from a period of time that I spend with the owner shadowing them, listening, and filling up notepads of all the words that come out of their mouth in relation to all of their constituents, their partners, their employees, their customers, everyone and developing an analysis of their language structures so they can understand themselves on a, on a deeper level, let's say, of their conscious, unconscious. They read the book, and then we go into a curriculum. So just to give you some context of what I do, I wouldn't call, consider myself a culture expert, per se, because experts teach theories. I'm working on a theory that is yet to be inculcated into our business culture, and I do that behind the scenes with organizations in real estate mortgage, corporate consulting and coaching, home improvement and software, and some of the people that we know I've worked behind the scenes with them. Just to clarify, we can go anywhere with this conversation because this is not just a corporate conversation, it's an individual conversation. Because to understand the individual, you have to understand the group, and to understand the group, you have to understand the individual. So everybody listening to this, we can go wherever you want to go. Yeah, so let me let me ask you this, Jay. This is this is I think this is interesting because you got bigger pockets, right? And you got a you got a lot of, of entrepreneurs, you got people that are just out there, they're grinding every day. And you may have some people that say, you know what, that's not a problem for me because I'm a one-man show, I'm a two-person show, I'm a this, I'm a that. And you know, they label themselves to to diminish who they are and what they do, I think. And they'll say, like, that's not that's that's down the road. That that's a that's a 2.0 version. And I personally disagree. I, I think that this is a now thing because you're planting those, well, you could say the neural pathways, you could say the habits, whatever it is, the daily rituals that you're doing, you know, you don't just all of a sudden create, you know, well, I, I was told by my mentor, he goes, Steve, let me tell you something. He goes, you can create a $5 million company pretty easy. He goes, you, you could probably screw up a bunch of shit and still make a $5 million company. But he goes, if you want to make a 20 or $50 million company, you have to start right now and you have to change who you are because that doesn't just happen. And so that's when I started learning about the culture. And I was like, 
you know, I, I couldn't even think along those lines because I thought, well, I'm not close to a $20 million company. But if I never started thinking that way and I wasn't intentionally focused on building a company like that, it was never going to happen. And so what would you say to someone that says, that's not for me. I'm too small. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't even know what culture is. And you follow me around all day is a waste of time. If I gave you, Steve, I have to ask you because you're the avatar for all of our listeners. If I gave you $1 billion and only you could have the money, only you, would you let me kill you? No. So we, all right, we could start at a billion. You're worth more than a billion. What, what's the net value on someone's innate, intrinsic ability to ask questions, solve problems, make decisions? Well, we don't know because we don't know what we are in the essence of our being. So anyone that's watching this, whether if you think you're a person of one, you have to ask yourself, do you have parents? Do you have children? Yeah. Do you have a spouse? Do you plan on it? Do you have family? Do you have friends? Do you want family? Do you want friends? You said something earlier in this conversation about the individual who works or the entrepreneur that works and it's not making it not won't necessarily make them happy for the success. Is that correct? Like you were uh, it, making that case. Yeah. Think of think of uh, number one, what it is that I do has to do with all of us. I just choose to work in the corporate capacity with the owner of the organization because that's where the culture starts and ends. However, that's kind of the every nucleus. one of us that that's the nucleus of it. It starts right there, right? Think of it like the sun. If Earth is too close, it's Mars. If it's too far away, it's Pluto. Most business owners are micromanaging and creating Mars, or they're too far away and creating Pluto. So to go back to what you said, every individual here has the ability to make decisions. And based on their self-awareness, how they can look at something and regulate their emotion in relation to whatever happens externally, they can make better or worse decisions based on their goals, based on where they're aiming to, based on who they believe they want to be in this world. And the question is, are what they say and think in alignment with what they actually do? And meaning, you know, I say, I believe in this. Well, what are you doing? Oh, you're doing the opposite, but you're not aware of it. So then what happens? Well, you get results you don't like, and now you're not at peace, and you don't like yourself, and so on and so forth. Now, this impetus, this insecurity that all of us share is the necessary energy catalyst force that leads us to do things in this world. So no matter what, the question is, how do we interact with others in relation to doing these things in the world? And how do we feel when we go about the world? So this is a conversation, no matter what industry that we're in, because those industries are just tools externally that all of us navigate to solve other people's problems. And then, you know, we have this social uh, construct called, you know, a country or a city or a town. So, so anyway, this is an individual yeah. conversation first. Anyone that is interested, let's say, for example, anyone that's interested in real estate, you said something earlier as well, that it's not just, uh, and I'm putting, I'm paraphrasing, an asset that pays you money or something. There's actually people there. And right. the people there, well, they have a culture. And based on the alignment of the people that live there, let's say there's just there's more than one. There's, there's like a partnership forming and there could potentially be offspring. Well, based on that culture, that affects the person's bottom line. So then it ties back to how does the person pick or interview who that they who they put in to the actual apartments based on their ability to pick those people they have higher or lower turnover into those apartments which aren't only the home the culture they're also what everyone focuses on first which makes sense they're assets and they have a well a cash on cash return or they don't you profit on the buy or you don't like right? that so that language really at bottom uh, culture is affects anyone that's ever going to invest in real estate because they're investing into an asset that has actual human beings in it that they have to hire. Because when someone is in your investment property, technically they go to work every single day, they make money, they pay the government, whatever they end up doing with their taxes, but they also pay the landlord, which is you. So from some perspective, from some resolution, the more doors you have, the more employees you have that are 
culturally aligned with yours. So anyway, we could go in like a million ways yeah. with this. Well, they, they, yeah. yeah, I mean, essentially they're clients. I mean, I look at them when I talk to people, you know, they, the, a lot of a lot of investors or landlords seem to have this um, this mindset that like I own the property and you need to do as I say when they're talking to a tenant. And I'm like, they're your client. They actually pay your bills. Like you need to treat them like a client. They don't look. This is a capitalistic society. If somebody wants to go somewhere else, yeah, maybe they could leave and they get an eviction or something. But you know what though? At the end of the day, you still have a property, an income producing business that is not producing income. So. I was taught a long time ago, you can either win financially or you can win psychologically. If you let them think that they are the client, which they are, and you let them think they won, which is not winning, it's just a synergistic relationship, you are going to be much further along than trying to battle every battle. Now, I got a, a, there's a question here from Garrett I want to I want to hit on. <clears throat> he says, to what extent would you protect culture? Would you lose potential income to save a healthy culture? Choose people over money. It's a good question. So we we would have to, but before we get to the question, we have to define what it is our values are and how we're going to orchestrate ourselves in the world. So I would say to Garrett, what are three words that you'd like to live by, or uh, or believe you live by, and ask the closest people around you what three words uh, describe you, and now you're going to have a clear reflection of who you want to be or think you are versus who you actually are based on the observation of others. And when you get clear on that, it's going to be a lot easier to make this value judgments like that. Now, of course, you have to look at, uh, if we generalize it too much, you could be in a, a scenario where you're down to your last dollar and it's like, hey, do I choose people over money? Well, we have to judge this based on actual reality, not just, and I think, I believe that's where the culture conversation becomes in the clouds and it becomes something people can't touch. And it becomes something that isn't valuable to people because what does that have to do with our business? But it's actually how every single interaction that you have with your, with anyone in your life, there's either alignment where there's trust or there's misalignment where there isn't. So I'll give it, let's answer the question more succinctly. To what extent do you protect culture? Well, first, like I said, you have to get clear on what your values are. And that's only part of it, but clear on who you are, which is the values and who you actually are will be described by what people around you that know you most say about you because then you could see, is this who really who I really am? And that'll start actually self-awareness because the culture starts with the founder's individuality. Like, by the way, that's how our country, you got America in the background. That's great because it really did start with individual individuality and we are losing sight of that. So would you lose potential income to save a healthy culture? Well, the question first is, remember, if, if you think it's healthy and you haven't done the exercises necessary to really understand what it is, likelihood it isn't. Um, so, so you have to understand what, what is a healthy culture. I'll give you an example. Um, anyone listening to this that wants to say something to the closest people around them, clients, employees, friends, and holds their tongue out of fear, that relationship is an unhealthy culture. They're repressing how they feel. Okay, so if you anyone to relate with that, Hmm. Tell the truth. If the person is upset with you, embrace the conflict. Don't let it fester and build resentment. Ask questions, tell the truth, and get to the bottom of it. So, like, that's, a, that's something very tactical anyone could do to know if they even live a healthy culture in their life, right? Because the individual culture is a character. And once you have more than one person, now we have a culture, let's just say, like that, right? Choose people over money. So, this is the thing <laughs> the money. Uh, 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 yeah. People will end up doing business with people that reflect yep. the worst of them and the best of it, what they're aware of and what they aren't aware of, no matter what we do. So um, when, when, when an individual uh, is, let's say that you are, are seeking tenants, very right, practical, based on the questions that you ask in your interview or whomever that's running that section of the business, based on the questions they asked and not on the answer and then the next question just on the script of that interview question but based on the questions that are asked after you get an answer from the potential tenant based on those questions that they can't be contrived they have to be because you're looking at the person in the eyes you're open to understanding where they're coming from you're listening which is proven through asking that next question you didn't have prepared. 
because you're curious, you will know in you, even if you can't articulate it, you will know if this person's a fit. Hmm. So let me, let me ask you this. And, and I like these. And if you guys have more questions, and, keep them coming. And, and, and if people disagree, if they don't like, please speak up. It's your yeah. responsibility to yourself yeah. to question my authority, to question what I'm saying. And I will attempt to understand where you're coming from so we can, we can grow together and, and, and come. Well, and, 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 and I think you got, you know, there, there's people from all over the world watching this, right? So you've got a lot of different cultures and obviously that's, that's part of your upbringing and everything. And, what, what do you think is the, the number, well, I don't want to say number one, but what are some of the top reasons that, you know, you said you talked with, with business owners and I always say, whether you own one property or you're a one person show, or you have 50 client, 50 employees, you're running a business, whether you know it or not. Most of the time, the person that's actually in charge does not realize they're the ones that are actually running the business, which is why a lot of people fail. Um, but what do you find is the most common thread or most common theme of why a lot of these people fail when it comes, because they know the tactical part, right? They know how to, they know how to hammer a nail, right? They get that part. That's kind of the easy part, creating the right environment to succeed because now you have a trail of employees behind you. If you're going to grow, like right? the only way is leveraging uh, uh, staff. Where does the most common thread of what people fail in that realm, would you say? So, well, we'd have to define Fail in what sense? Fail in existentially? Are they like like you brought up earlier? Are they fulfilled with the thousand employees, or has it become a cage for them? They're actually the slave that they appear as the master. Yeah. Or are you saying they fail because that's in at bottom what I solve to most, which comes back to become even more profit because um, your actual culture grows. Or are you saying an individual that is in business but they fail because they actually go out of business, like they don't make money? Which one? Well. I guess, I guess what I say fail, you know, I know a lot of owners, right? They, they may try to grow. Like all of a sudden they've got this idea that they're going to grow. And all of a sudden, as it starts growing, you know, that pendulum starts swinging a little bit out of, out of their, their comfort zone. And maybe there's some self-sabotage. Maybe there's some, Hey, get out of the way. You can't do it as good as me. Um, I can never find good staff. All these reasons why they cannot grow. And to me, the reality of why they can't grow is, you know, it, a lot of we self-sabotage because we want to feel more important. Um, and so I, I, when I say fail, they're, they're, they're stuck where they don't want to be, whatever that is, whether it's, whether it's at one employee or whether it's at 50 employees and the 50 employees are now holding them hostage, they're just not in a happy state in their life. Because, you know, a lot of people that get into real estate, I have found, they get into this because they're exiting another career or another job. They're kind of, I don't want to say a retread, but they're a recycle of another industry. So they say, you know what? I don't like this. I'm going to go into real estate because they want to have the life that they want to have. And they see this idea that they could have this great lifestyle. And all of a sudden they realize this didn't happen in the way I thought it would be. This kind of sucks because now I'm basically working for a lot less money than I was if I had a W-2 job. And I don't have the freedom that I thought I was going to have. Yes. And I'm not happy. So what is the common reason why they get stuck in that, you know, from the, they, they have this motivation when they start, right. And they're hard charging motivation is, is, you know, that that's, that's like a battery, right. It dies over time. Why, why don't they succeed and push through in your opinion? Okay. So there's many, that answer, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe I, maybe I, I don't know if that answered the, the question. Well, this is, this is, yeah, I, I love, I, like I said, I'm an open book. So the, the actual basis for any movement would be a deficit. We are seeking something, this seeking that we are insecure, all of us. And that is okay. Cause it's actually, well, it is what it is. The question is, what are we going to do with that insecurity? Now, if we start an idea that is now our own, we're meaning all the responsibility falls on us and we come from another culture where we perceived in the world, let's say we were an employee, we perceived that we had this responsibility and the success was because of us and we did this and we did that. And of course, there's some individual in our hero's journey, in our life story, someone superior to us, at least positionally, that was an, an archetypal mentor, an individual that helped us, that served us. And that relationship 
became inevitably at odds, resentment built, and that was the psychological impetus for the, the hero in this journey, which is all of us in our own journeys, to leave that culture. Let's say it was an employee working for a company, which I would agree that that's what I, you know, we start as this and we go to this, to leave that culture and say, I have a vision, a vision, because that's what a business is. It's first. It's a vision to a solution of a problem first. A vision to a solution of a problem based on a competency of the individual, whatever they've done or believe they've done. So a vision of a solution of a problem first. And the profit is the margin in between what it costs to solve a problem and what comes in. So in their mind, they have a vision to a solution of a problem. I did this over here and I did it this well and I'm not appreciated and then this isn't working out. And maybe, or maybe... They love their job. They, like, there's all sorts of ways that this could manifest. They loved what they did. However, they hit like a ceiling with their income and it wasn't enough. And maybe they sat in solitude long enough and just started thinking about who they were and they didn't like how they felt. And they said, am I going to do this within 40 years? And they think, I better get rich. So they leave the company again. Like it'll manifest different ways. Right. So they start the organization. Everything is started out of conflict internally. Internal conflict leads to external creation. It's the, 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 the movement physiologically that is the effect of that impetus that cause and through through that through that movement what i this is part of my theory what i see what i've observed is the let's talk about the entrepreneur first. the entrepreneur they have a vision now they go to the marketplace well they're a person of one they have to be able to communicate that vision to all of their constituents and they're going to face judgment they're going to face doubt right they're going to face obstacles externally that create friction internally and based on how they interact with these opportunities to either embrace conflict or repress conflict what naturally happens in our culture our business culture due to lack of awareness education we'll get into that if you have, like i said i have seven hours what happens is the individual represses that internal conflict because they may actually be really good. So to answer your question very simply before I make it more complicated to make it simple at the end, if they don't give up and they really are good at whatever they do, if they just don't stop and they just keep doing it for me over many iterative years, eventually their brand or belief consumers have an end to solve a problem becomes so enlarged that people just start calling them. But in between that, they really can't quit. And just to clarify some of my, where my research, I've interviewed 237 of the most successful people that I could find in and around my immediate area in the last three and a half years. And that's my research and development into the part of it, into the psyche of people by doing what you're doing, listening, asking questions. So anyone could check that out. They look me up. Cool. The individual naturally, to answer your question a little bit further, will build a, uh, a wall. Yeah. And if they... <laughs> They, they will not trust because they didn't trust from the beginning because the lack of trust in the beginning is what was the actual impetus or energy to go out and strive in the first place. Now, just to clarify, this is not a bad thing or a good thing. This just is what it is. This is just how life works psychologically for us. The question is, are there people that are the entrepreneur or the people that are employees? It's like, we're the same thing with a different worldview based on whatever probabilistic circumstances. So, this is what occurs. The same, uh, there is a correlation between that the competence come and whatever they did for a company comes from like time over task. They put a lot of time into something over that utility through that internal conflict and they get really good. Good enough to have that vision to solution of a problem to start the company. Now they have the doubters. Now they say, oh, I got haters. That manifests linguistically in our culture, haters. You know, that's right. a fabrication of man. It's not a real person or right. it's actually just a language game that, that, that reflects that internal projection. And of course, it's going to be hard to let go of other jobs around them because they don't trust people in the first place. Right. Well, that's why they, that's why they ended up creating their own company is because they didn't trust other people and they thought I could do now, it just better than that guy. When we say they... It isn't to uh, disassociate our responsibility for the conversation. We are the they. Like when right. we say they, 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 we are the they. Right. right. We are the they. All of us together. This is this is what unifies us as a culture. 
the human culture. We are the they. So the individual, as long as anyone, listen, let's say, you know, the existential is driving you nuts and you're just like, how do I make money and build a business? Well, the question is, are you really, really, really good at something? Well, if you are, the question is, well, how do you let people know in the most cost effective way with, and, and well, you can't quit. Well, in 2020, every single person listening to this, especially if they're involved with bigger pockets, has the information, education, and resources to learn real estate, for example, to get really, really good at it. How do they get good? They learn, they have mentors, they take action, and they can share information like you are, which will help them grow their brand, excuse me, their brand or the belief consumers have in them to solve problems faster. My advice to anyone listening, and this is that you don't have to work with me. This is anybody's advice. Anybody could do this in the whole world. I choose to work behind the scenes with the owner of an organization. Anybody could do this. Embrace conflict. Stop using the word hater. It's a fabrication of your own inability to face conflict. Ask questions because you want to know the answers. Tell the truth because the owner or the employee that ask questions with the intention to understand well actually if they're open and they're curious hear what is unsaid and if they don't omit and hold back what they believe and they tell the truth they're going to see who people actually are and based on how they interact with that person they're going to grow which is going to be from them embracing conflict through that interaction and grows in their awareness about themselves or they're going to repress and put it under the rug. See, the reason I said I'm a, I'm a theorist and I was clear about that is our entire personal development culture, which is ties into how this company, because I did research a little bit. I like to understand the culture before I get into it so I can provide more value and really just I'm curious as hell. This organization was founded out of an idea that like, all right, Joshua, this is what he said in a podcast. I really was taken by. I love it. Joshua was like, he just bought eight units. They weren't doing well. He's 2,000 miles away. This is what his story was. And he couldn't manage it. Other people were managing it. It didn't work out. He's looking for information and resources, how to learn about real estate. And it was like just funnel after funnel. Like he had to pay for every little thing. There wasn't an information resource. So out of that internal conflict, personally, which is always there, the external conflict of real estate investing didn't work out. A vision to a solution of a problem. I'm going to create a website that actually aggregates information and creates a cult. That's what it is. It's a culture right? that pulls people together that can also learn this. Now, of course, that took years to develop. Sure. sure. But that's because his vision to a solution of a problem was what he went through, envisioned how to solve it, and went to go build it. And from his personal story, it was evident eight years in, he hired a consultant based on his, what I read or, or what I listened to. That helped him realize that he's got to hire other people. That was uh, one of the gentlemen that do the other podcast on the, on the iTunes. I, I just lost his name, but who's, be, who's Brandon, still there Brandon. to this day? Brandon, yeah, he was his first employee, and he said how much that enabled him to start working on other stuff. Sure. But all right, what was the external impetus that led to him to be able to let go? Well, an outside force that helped observe him. That's why I go back to that guy's question that he's like, Hey, should I sacrifice money or the people or how do I do, you know, a healthy culture? You can't know if your culture is healthy. If you don't write down, this is just an exercise. Anybody do write down who you want to be like, what are some words that you believe describe you and go ask the closest people in your life without telling them those words. Hey, what, what would you say is three words of describing? And see if they all align with the same words you wrote down. If they don't, you don't have, you may not have a healthy culture, yeah. my friends. Right. Which well, means okay, you're so, not as open as you think you are. Anyway, so uh, yeah, no, it's okay. good. So okay, so someone else, you someone else is asking uh, DJ uh, DZ Javat, uh, what personality would most fit for the healthy culture leadership strategy? <laughs> yeah. uh, no matter what anyone's personality we all have a capacity to tell the truth now the question is what is the truth well i i, I would like, 
based on how honest someone is with themselves, whatever they say to someone else will be more in alignment with what is true based on what they think they know. So no matter what your personality is, you have to ask yourself, am I, am I asking questions to the, to my employees, clients, spouse, girlfriend, kids, am I asking questions to understand? Am I open to listening? Am I honest with people? Anybody in any culture, that's why it says culture matters. So the belief of culture matters is when people read to think, write to develop, listen to hear what is unsaid, and speak to let go, they develop more value for themselves and others. So my purpose with the Culture Matters podcast, it's a medium that reflects this, is to have a guest on like you're doing right now and to uncover their genius. That's the purpose of Culture Matters, to uncover their genius. What I do with my clients, can't work with everybody, Use the podcast to do that so people can listen to conversations. The goal, my goal, the goal of Culture Matters, which is, remember, Culture Matters is, 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 is language that reflects an idea. The question is, what's the story? What's the symbolism? You see where I'm going with that? We all can create. The goal is to make curiosity cool. The vision is that human culture is open, curious, and focused on creating the future. So the mission, what I'm going to do, the lead to model is read, write, listen, and speak every day. That's, that's what culture matters is about. I, I believe that. That's what I do. That's what I put out there. So anyway, to answer the guy's question, uh, Javat, uh, DJ Javat, the, the individual that is open, curious, ask questions to understand, right? Because they're open and curious. That doesn't omit. Tell the truth. Now, when you do that, you're going to have conflict. Embrace it. They don't need to be the hater. They could just be telling you the best damn advice you've ever never listened to. Well, um, and, you know, there's no personality I, for that. It's a human potential. Yeah. And I've always, you know, the, the, the way, again, I, I kind of, I've got the third grade mentality. So the way the way it was put to me was a, a manager tells people to march up the hill. A leader has them follow them up the hill. That's the difference. It's like pushing a string or pulling a string. And, it, you know, the 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 I would say like to me and, and again, I'm not a, I'm not a, as well versed as you are. But the, the leadership, you know, owning a company myself and, and having teams underneath me, you know, the leader has people follow the vision. And so it's a matter of really painting that, in my opinion, it's painting that picture and creating that vision that gets people to want to follow you. So if I have the the idea in my head and I cannot convey that to the team, they're going to be like, I'm not going to work there anymore because I'm just going there for a paycheck and I can get 50 cents an hour more at this place. So why should I go there? People go to work. I think people go to work for a vision and they go to work with a leader. And that's why people go to follow a movement, you know, and that's, I, I think that's what people, people want to believe yes. they're okay. doing something, in, in my opinion, that, well, you know, do, do you agree with that? Or is that, am I off on that? If we were to relate the industrial age to the information age, right? I would agree wholeheartedly, meaning in the, in the industrial age, that's a different ecosystem, meaning sure accountability was paramount versus autonomy. Right. So meaning, let's say you have a hundred percent of businesses in the industrial age, 99% could operate very successfully under the managerial ethos, different culture. Business is uh, one of the layers in a framework of a nation as technology has continually developed to increase the opportunity for each individual within the company to have a literal voice, internet, email, reviews. It started with all of those small iterative steps. So the individuals within the ecosystem had more and more of a voice at work. It became more and more important towards the end of the industrial age into the information age for business leaders to think and act out exactly what you just said, which is what I agree with pulling of the string because the, the, and, and having that clear vision 
is part of, like I said earlier, the culture puzzle. What's the story? But that's only part of it because North Korea has a great story, language, symbolism, mediums, and a tyrannical, closed-minded dictator. In 2025 and 30, I'm a, I'm, remember, theory, this is in the future. So it's not that that is, uh, for the time it was, great. We're evolving though. So the follower, the vision is not enough because every single person that works in a company has the ability, just like you are right now as a micro ecosystem within this macro culture of bigger pockets as a belief consumers have in them to solve a problem. Just as you have the opportunity to have your individual voice spread, everyone else listening to this does too. So that's where the culture conversation becomes even more vital and questioning, like, how do you actually maintain that alignment? Because what will end up happening in any culture is when the people aren't interacted in a way that they actually can have autonomy, open, curative, and work their own life, and they see more and more of that in the real world, more and more resentment builds to whatever ecosystem working within. So the vision isn't enough anymore is what I'm saying. Right. Yeah, I can how see. the leader actually, so I'll give you an example. Let's say a leader says, guys, we're going to the moon. And then right after that, and, and everybody believes them. And then they all go to the bathroom, like at different times. They're like, yeah, they go to different bathrooms, right? What's everybody doing on their phone? Well, they're looking at the... They're looking at the world they're not in. But this is the thing. We're in that world. We're already in a virtual world. Nothing has changed, my friends. We've been in a virtual world for some time. That phone is an extension of our frontal cortex. We live there. They're thinking, you know, I could do this over here. So they leave the bathroom because they see the world, that all these possibilities. And it's in our internal psyche to compare ourselves to so that we can reorient ourselves and get better in the world. So there's nothing bad. This judgment is very important. So they leave the bathroom and then that same leader that just said, we're going to the moon. This is the vision. These are our values that talked about them, that thinks about them, that really believes that they're the owner for it. They live them. So does something. Hold on. This is the whole point. The leader does something to contradict the values. They, they have a conversation with the employee where they're rude, dismissive, passive, talk at them. Yeah, they want more accountability because they don't know how to create autonomy. To actually create autonomy, you have to be self-aware. To be self-aware, you have to embrace conflict. To embrace conflict, you have to ask questions and listen, tell the truth. So you are correct about the, the, the ethos for the John Maxwell's, that's an example, and you know, he eloquently took that from the Bible and secularized it. That is actually antiquated in 2020 because in the augmented age, accountability without education and, 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 and effective interaction, which is through conflict and honesty and these Fundamental human things that have that are not in our culture whatsoever, not in our victim, you know, PC culture. Right. That creates you ready for that? Accountability without education and that interaction becomes autocracy, it becomes dictatorship, it becomes the opposite of whatever the vision is espoused to be, and people won't put up with it for long. They will go and do other things. So the leader has to be able to create the uh, bring out the best in people in a, in a, in a way that has uh, not been portrayed in, in business culture or it never has that has had to have because as we and that's why I like bigger when I was doing research look at the, the company how it scales and how it grows like even even this is a is a is an act what we're doing is an actual representation of a company that 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 is very much in the future doing something very powerful giving you the ability to actually bring value to all of these people to continue to cultivate this educational informational resource where it all flows and all it all it all comes back to us so you're going to see we're going to continue to see companies that are smaller internally with who works with them like as employee internally but more people that are working through belief through volunteer and everybody wins um 
So that's why so we, I said earlier with the, with the investment property, it's not our client, it's our employee. It's our cultural right. employee. Everyone's a cultural employee. So that's my short answer. But now, basically that it's- So I got I got uh, just to bring this back to real estate. So Garrett is asking, define a culture that I can create that will result in retaining tenants longer. So we're talking about creating the client uh, relationship, right? Um, employee, client, what, whatever our terminology is. How, do, how does somebody do that and, and create a long-term relationship, you know, over the course of, because obviously the longer, the longer a tenant stays, the, the, the better your return is and, and your lifetime of the client and all that stuff. How does someone do that? Like I said earlier, start with those questions, like writing down what you believe, what words, if you were gone, you would want your kids or people to describe you as. Ask three of the people closest to you in your life what three words they would describe you as and see if there's a matchup. You gotta start with yourself. Who are you? How do you interact with people? Because this is the thing. If you, because if you write down, all right, this is my company name, this is my personal story, meaning you could, you know, Garrett, what have you been through? Conflict, like, ah, I failed in 2003. I came up in 2008. This is what I achieved. Great. That story is a story that you tell people after you get to know them because now, like, as you're asking questions, you can build a, 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 an alignment with it. However, if you're interacting with people in a way that isn't honest, that story ends up just being a, a guise, a manipulation. Uh, and so that's not what you want. You have to be, if you're interviewing tents, you have to actually uh, interview them in a way where you can get to the core of, is this person someone that I would have in my unit? Now, how do you know that? Well, you got to be clear on who you are so you could see this person doesn't align with these values that represent me. So maybe it's not a good idea. Maybe this won't work out. What's the long term? But what, what do people usually do? They're unclear of any of this. They want to get a tenant in there. They may not even interview them in depth or have somebody else do it that they don't even really know them well which doesn't take a long period of time. It takes an hour to get somebody, to get to know somebody really well. Just an hour of asking questions. And when they give you an answer, you don't just start talking, you ask another question. The only way to actually ask another question is to be listening. So you have to ask yourself some of these questions. It's very, uh, because if you're not clear on who you are and then you, uh, and you go to interview people, you're gonna end up with people that represent uh, you're the worst parts of you. But how, how do you, how do you or foster you hire that someone to start interviewing tenants yeah. over, over term? How do you foster that over a long term period? So that's the, and that's like you said, that's creating it. How do you keep it oh, going now? Example. Let's say that you, well, here it is. You start yeah. with yourself. You have to do that exercise to really start even right. reflecting. I mean, and you say, I, I want to skip that. That's okay. That's what you'd like to do. But I would start there. Right. If you're picking your tenants in the beginning, how do you how do you have friends if you never ask them any questions? How do you even know people? You got to do those interviews, and that's where you're going to learn what to look for. Understanding what you stand for helps you get clear on what you're looking for, and you are hiring character, just like if you were a company. You're hiring character, and you're that's also true. looking, hey. How long have they held a job? What are, the, what are their statements? But like, that's part of it. What's their character? Now, when you want to scale that, it's like anything. You have to hire someone to start doing that interview. Right. So you have to take the same process there. Now, this is the thing. Even if you do that the best possible, well, based on how you interact with the people closest to you in your life, you might just drive everybody up a wall. And then it's easy for you to blame them. Until I started listening to people, which I started interviewing people to listen, to learn. Shut up, Jay. All I did was talk and talk and talk and talk because I'm insecure. I want people to like me. I'm 10 years old, fat, hate myself, pulling my skin. I want to, I need attention. Like, let me work out. And now everyone's asking me workout questions. I was the best talker. Listen to my podcast. I'm asking questions. I'm not pontificating. 
Mm -hmm. I had to do that. If that isn't possible, you're going to be surrounded by people. Or, I mean, if one doesn't act that out, you're going to be surrounded by people that don't know you because you don't know yourself. How does this affect business in every freaking possible way? Because your turnover goes down, your productivity goes up, you like yourself more, you make more money, you have better relationships. Right? I have the pleasure of working with the most extraordinary people because I'm extraordinary. I tell the truth. If it doesn't work for somebody, that's totally cool. Uh, my responsibility is to ask them questions. If they say, hey, dude, I don't know. I don't, I don't like what you're saying. And this is the reason why I'm like, all right, like, what do you mean by that? How do I? So, all right, you get clear on yourself. Write down some of the things you stand for. Use that as a template to interview. You can actually take those values those words that you would use to describe yourself like you write the words down like whatever those words be like what they mean to you like a sentence and that's the basis for your script to ask questions on an interview but you don't stay on it totally you have to actually listen to people which means when the tenant starts talking what you tend to find in business whether no matter what kind of business it is the person hiring is trying to sell themselves on the person they're hiring if I'm talking as much as I am now when I'm hiring you, which is what I see with business owners, I'm only going to be surrounded by people who want something from me and I don't even know who they are. And it's okay to want something from someone. We all start in admiration. We admire in others what we don't respect in ourselves. And that's what mentorship is about. We admire in others what we don't yet respect in ourselves. And it's through that incompetence that affects our ego, and our ego is a good thing to develop and cultivate through competence. It's through that scarcity that we look for a mentor. Oh, you can help me with this. And then they help us and it gives us, you know, we, we start building ourselves up. So that's what they like. You're interviewing people, anybody this, this is a trillion dollar question or answer. Are you talking the whole interview? Like I'm talking because I was invited to talk. All right, I'm going to talk. Right. But if it's an interview, I get inside people's heads. That's my responsibility. So I know who they are, what they're about, how I can solve their problem. Potentially we could work together. Right. So all the relationships that I have that I work with, I love these people because we, 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 we love each other. We're, 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 we're units. And the money comes because you charge money. You, 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 you know, when you value yourself, you increase your price 10 trillion fold. Now, this is one more thing. Imposter syndrome. Have you heard of that? People bring that up all the time. Yeah. Yeah. That language is a symptom of an unaware culture without a, a, a value of a, without a, an education system that is productive for the augmented age. An unaware culture without an education system that really doesn't know anything, hasn't put in the work to learn, doesn't like themselves, wants to be everybody else. Of course, they're going to feel like imposters because I mean, that's a linguistic uh, congealment of this unaware, unsophisticated culture that any of us can learn anything in the world right now. That's what you're all here. You're all learning. But, but, but this is the case. If you feel like an imposter, take a hard look in the mirror and ask yourself, do I really know what I'm doing? And if you do that, you might realize, yo, I'm, I actually don't know what I'm doing. And that's okay because you're in this group and you're, at, you're not what you think you're doing or say you're doing. You actually might know more. Yeah, you're doing, you're, you actually are doing it because you're here learning. So they have to look at it. If you feel like an imposter, you may actually not know anything. So you have to look, am I reading enough? Am I writing enough? Am I, am I, am I getting around mentors? Am I sharing information to people that could learn from me? Am I not, if I'm not doing these things every day or, or at least often, how am I going to continue learning about my craft? I mean, let's look at this. Everything that I'm saying has been proven by business models just like this. An individual gets a brilliant idea in 2003 or whatnot that really started when he was in college and his friends wanted to buy an apartment building. And by the way, this story was on a podcast. It's a great story. This is the story that 
uh, Joshua was sharing. He wanted to always, you know, wanted to come up. He was at New York, Wall Street. Like this resonates. They couldn't buy the apartment building in college. He ends up getting a teaching job, high school, four years in. Wife's mom was the principal, couldn't get out, and then he ends up uh, buying eight units, and then they didn't work out. Like all that, all that conflict because he didn't have the information he needed. He let it started the the platform that aggregates all this amazing information. I was looking at it; it was, it's profound, it's huge. That helps all these people now. How do they? How do they get successful? They, they well, the the business actually does this for everybody. It 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 created a they created a medium through this vision that actually brought all these people together that don't have the information. I just said people aren't educated. Helps them get educated, helps them serve and be served mentors, and changes all these lives. And look how successful it's been. Look how successful it's been. Everybody here has the potential to do whatever the heck they want to do in this world. You don't need to be a billionaire to be influential. You just have to ask your kid questions and tell the truth to your wife or your husband or whatever you're married to. Right. We're all, yeah. So, so uh, this, you know, I can keep going, but it's basically like if you feel like you don't know much, you may not. It's like when you feel guilty, that's your brain telling you, hey, how can I learn from this scenario? But what do we do? And what are we coached to do? Oh, it's not your fault. It's their fault. Well, it's actually no one's fault, but it is your responsibility. It is your responsibility to call that person back and say, hey, we got off the phone and I really didn't like the way I felt after our conversation. This is why. Well, so, Jay, let me ask you this. And, and I know we've got to wrap soon a little bit because they give us an hour. Um for people that are pushing out of the backside of all this new norm stuff and, and they're going to basically deal with the remaining part of 2020, what advice, wh whether they're in real estate or business or just personal, what advice would you give them? I, and I know a lot of people are like, you know, hoping that it's going to be great and they, they say all these things and, you know, you get, you get the spectrum, right? But what advice would you give people for the, for the down and dirty of how to actually deal with what's coming in the next 6, 12, 18 months that is probably going to be much different than it was the first half of 2020. How does somebody deal with that, in your opinion? Okay. Well, so, okay, big, big side is, number one, is owning assets that cash flow in this air epoch we're in now, this new age of the world, where the traditional culture of America, the white picket fence, single home, American dream is dissolving itself. Owning cash flowing properties, like owning real estate is one of the most important things I believe for a human that's just like Bob or Mary or Jane to do in, 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 in this next 50 year property. Like people, uh, we're in this era where we ride share and we share things and whatnot. Right. The, the, this is basically because of how capitalism works. It only, uh, Everything everyone has is worth less the more that it grows and it has to grow, it has to grow, it has to grow. So the way I would look at it is everyone, we have to grow in, 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 what, in what we own that cash flows as, as individuals, responsible individuals in America for, because what's happening, this new norm isn't good. And uh, 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 I would say... Uh, the protection for an individual in their sovereignty in this this country and other countries in the world is uh, what means they have and how they interact with others. And you better set yourself up to be able to have means and leverage and be able to make moves because the world is changing dramatically. Right. And we don't know what the future holds. No conspiracy. It doesn't need to be someone out to get us. It's called the world is decentralizing and we're seeing uh basically okay uh, i have to simplify this for everybody this is the biggest opportunity ever ever for any individual to create an audience to share yeah. how they feel to, to to attract relationships in their life that could help them grow ones that create conflict and ones that don't meaning like but there should always be but like basically pull in your audience so anyone could do that just like you're leading by example 
building an audience, like having a voice in this world has never been easier. It's bigger than the printing press of the 1600s, 1400s, like huge opportunity, this right. thing, huge opportunity. And, 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 and owning real estate has always been an opportunity. However, people have to look at this and what we're doing. That's why I like bigger pots. It seems like it's, it is super innovative. Uh, the new asset for the 21st century is online real estate. So every interview that I do with individuals where I bring out, it's like a work of art for me. I'm getting inside of who they are and their being. That's an online asset. So you got two amazing resources with the bigger pockets, like the Edwards ever fingertips. Uh, well, besides the education, that's like a foundation. You have education, information. You can have the education start buying real estate. And you also have the medium already set for you to like have a voice. So, th so those two assets in 2030 are going to be hand in hand. Like how much influence do you have and how much physical assets do you have? Those go hand in hand. I think that's going to continue uh, as long as, you know, our voices aren't, I don't think 1984 is a, is a reality, you know, like to be censored right. on that degree. Although we are seeing some really scary stuff when it comes to the, you know, cutting people's voices out. But um, yeah. my advice would be, you have to, you have to share what you know, and you have to, you have to learn, read to think, write to develop, listen to hear what is unsaid, and speak to let go. If you do it on this, you're going to meet some great people and really grow. So like yeah. we could look at this very negatively of what the world's going, or we look at it super positively. Right now, we're not at war at some catastrophic level, so let's look at it really super positively. Invest in real estate and invest in your online real estate because this conversation is an online asset. Right. And this will be worth money someday when I'm dead and like 17 million people want to know who was the crazy guy. And people need to wake up to that fact. This is online real estate. So that, that would be like my short answer. Yeah. So this is, no, uh, you know, nothing, social media is not changing us. We have been assholes collectively since Australopithecus. In the cave, there was somebody in the back saying, culture doesn't matter, forget your stupid net, Bob, you can't throw the spear. You stink. There was another person in the corner crying, saying, ah, don't talk to me like that. You better watch what you say around me. Social media hasn't changed us one bit. It's revealing. Yeah. It's just it's yeah. revealing who we are. Every time somebody posts something on their timeline, they're telling you who they are. They're yeah. telling you. You're, they're, they're revealing their autobiography. Yeah, agreed. So totally just agree. think of that. No, I agree. I agree. Well, Jay, I, I appreciate your time. I know we kind of went over a little bit, so I apologize. Um, so, Jay, if, if people want to get a hold of you and find you and learn more about what you do, how, how do they do that? So, J A Y D O R A N, Facebook, LinkedIn, Jay Duran, YouTube. I recommend the Culture Matters podcast. Uh, two times a week, we share people's stories. I'm interviewing individuals to get into the depths of what they are about in the, in their life to uncover their genius. That's a free resource. 30 days of thought is a book that I authored. And the premise is that in the book, the reader reads a, a page, not to memorize what I have to say, but to think their own thought. And then on the next page, there's a, place for them to write what they think, not what they're memorizing from me. Right. And then it shows them how to film a video and holds them accountable to actually film a video of their thought so they can put it out in the world and people sure. can actually know who they are because as they're going, so read to think, write to develop, like that medium represents that. So that's 30 days of thought on Amazon, but I, I recommend the podcast. Follow me. I put out, I write an article every day. So every day an article goes out on Facebook, LinkedIn. Cool. Uh, Very cool. Make you think. Awesome. Awesome. 
Well, Jay, thank you so much for your time. Again, I apologize we went over a little bit. Uh, it was good information. I think it's important that people understand that that this is this is out there. It's vital. It's necessary. And, it, and it's what we've got to do to keep evolving in, in this new world. So I think it's it's definitely, it's not going away. Like you said, it's always been there. I think it's just more prevalent now. And, and I think we're starting to see just how prevalent it is. And obviously, you know, Bigger Pockets does a great job of allowing us to come on the show and, and convey our thoughts and really get people to understand that it's it's a much it's a much bigger picture than four walls and a roof. You know, there, there's a lot more to this when it comes to building that culture to be successful. And you know, this isn't always the the fun, sexy thing, but it's important and it's part of the foundation and it's like the spinal cord that keeps everything going. I think, in my opinion, to make companies and to make people you know, more successful to go to where they want to go so that people follow them and, and whether it's virtually, physically, whatever it is. Um, so Jay, thank you so much uh, for your time today. I do appreciate it and bigger pockets. Again, I always uh, am honored to be able to be the host. Mind Property Management gives me the opportunity. So if anyone's looking for that, they can, you know, check them out. And uh, everybody, thanks for watching and we will see you next week. We'll talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.